But I just want to introduce our incredible host, Nick Galifianakis. Amazingly, I pronounced that correctly. I, right, right, right? Nick, <laughs> Nick's cartoons appear alongside his, by the way, might I add his ex-wife's column, Carolyn Hacks in the Washington Post. His incredible cartoons are now included in a book entitled, If You Love Me, You'd Think This Was Funny. So please love him enough to think everything he says is funny. Nick Galifianakis. and I am. Wait, 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 wait. Is this on? <clears throat> Hold it, come here, Christina. Come here. Did I get it wrong? Galifianakis. Galifianakis. I put the A in there. Say it. Galifianakis. Say it. My God, I feel powerful. Oh. Starts with a gal and ends with a kiss. And a lot of fun in between. That's... <clears throat> I didn't know he was here. That's my father. He used to tell me that, actually he would tell me that when I was a kid and a shy, you know, trying to approach uh, girls. Starts with a gal, ends with a kiss. As I got older, I was like, Dad, why couldn't our name start with a gal and end with a fuck? <laughs> I'm sorry. There might be some language here tonight. Hopefully that was it. Welcome, packed house. Standing room only, how great is this? And especially welcome to my fellow journalists. You guys are here, well, fellow, I'm a relationship cartoonist. I'm a journalist in the way that Olive Garden is an Italian restaurant, so. You, know. you cover news, I cover relationships, but we're both making a living off of somebody's misery. You know, your war, pestilence, now nuclear fallout. With me, it's, dear Carolyn, my husband won't pick up around the house and I'm tired of carrying all this responsibility and I'm really starting to resent him. So I'm gonna cut off the sex. Or, dear Carolyn, I'm not attracted to my wife anymore. I don't want to have sex with her, so I've stopped picking up around the house. <laughs> We're here for the Committee to Protect Journalists and, of course, Reporters Without Borders and the group that I founded after Carol and I divorced, Reporters with Very Clearly Defined Boundaries. President and sole member, if anybody. <clears throat> no, adorable ex-wife, I'm not gonna talk about her. Uh, Christina mentioned my book, I have a book that's out. If you loved me, you'd think this was cute, uncomfortably true cartoons about you. If you loved me, you would buy my book. I just got back from book tour, I, like, off of book tour, they asked me to do this like 11 minutes ago. And uh, it's, uh, if you guys ever, that's very pretentious. If you ever get a, if you ever put a book out, go on tour. <laughs> it's real, everybody should do it. Spectaculars, hotels and great restaurants and fast women and adoring fans. Or just hotels. Or just my friend's couch. And one night on a bench in a bus station. Anyway, uh, I started in the corner of the country and went all the way. We have an enormous country. Very diverse cultures full of very, very strange people. I was leaving Seattle and I hopped into a cab. Nice enough cab driver, he didn't say much, but he held the door for me. We start coming up to a rise, going over a bridge, over this body of water, and finally he speaks. He looks in the rear view mirror and he just, out of the blue, says, what do you do? I said, I'm a cartoonist. The next thought that came out of his head was one unpunctuated sentence. He says, I like cartoons. Gary Ridgely murdered and dumped the bodies of 48 women in this river. <laughs> it's 
still looking at me in the rearview mirror. <laughs> he says, Ted Bundy was from Seattle, too. Um, I, I'm a cartoonist. The only thing I, the closest thing I have to a weapon is like a pen nib. They're, they're this big. My mind is frantically calculating. I have to stab him about 45,000 times to try to get away. From there, I dropped down into Portland, Oregon. Have you ever been? Anybody? Yeah. Simply by stepping across the city line, the number of people in Portland that are not pierced or tattooed doubled. Everybody, wool cap, they all look like my, if you're familiar with my cousin Zach, everybody in Portland looks like my cousin Zach with the beard, a little belly, wool cap, everybody, even the men. <laughs> and it was irritating because I would, I would go and talk to these people and everyone's wearing the wool cap and the funky hairstyle and the weird facial hair and the tattoos. He got a truck axle through his nose and he's wearing a plaid shirt and he's like, you know, yeah, we're just, we're nonconformists, you know, we're not really into the whole suit and tie thing, and, you know, we're individuals and very expressive, and do our thing. Fine. I talk to the next guy, wool cap, beard, <laughs> tattoos, spike through his forehead. <laughs> you know, we're just, we're all, we're very individual here, you know, we don't conform <laughs> with that. Why? These people have non-conformed into the most conformist society I've ever been in in my life. <laughs> On down through to San Francisco, which if you've, yeah, it's a beautiful, San Francisco is a beautiful city. If you don't know it's a beautiful city, and if you can't see it's a beautiful city, everybody from San Francisco will make sure that you know it's a beautiful city. They'll make, they'll make sure you know everything about San Francisco. And, I, you know, I don't mean to offend anybody's sensibility. Well, usually when you say that, you're about to offend somebody's sensibility. <laughs> no. Th these people vote probably the way I vote, and yet there's something about them that still makes me want to grab a whole grain baguette and beat the living shit out of them. <laughs> Just knock the smugness right out of them. I dropped down from there into Los Angeles. Well, Los Angeles. It was just a, right, yeah. Woo! <laughs> just a, it's a variation on getting somebody, you know, you're like, excuse me, excuse me, could you stop looking in the mirror long enough? I have a book here. It's a book, look, it's got pictures. <laughs> if you flip the pictures, <laughs> they move. Will that do it for you? Then on down to uh, Arizona. Uh, I'm assuming most of you have been here in August, where the humidity is biblical, and to breathe, you require the lungs of a frog. <laughs> Arizona is the exact opposite. Oh, my God. I spent the night, I got there at night, slept in my hotel room, slept, I woke up in the morning, and I could only say one word. <laughs> Somebody had poured, like, an entire box of crackers into my nose. <laughs> I was not dehydrated. I was mummified. <laughs> I would blink, and it was audible. <laughs> I got up, I, and my system is just not used to it. I was walking through the lobby. Plants would die as I passed them because I was sucking every bit of moisture out of the air. <laughs> Trees were bending my way. I walked by a really pretty girl, and her lips cracked. Then I went up to another desert place, Las, Las Vegas. I mean, what, do you, what can you say about Las Vegas that hasn't been said by a million people? And being on book tour in Vegas was, uh, I mean, you look around at the people, even the people that show us, like, Unsolved Mysteries, I found everybody. There was gambling in the bookstore. I'm doing a book signing, and they're gambling. I got more interested in the gambling. I'm trying to give a presentation, and I'm like, is that how you play craps? 
I've never figured that. I always play blackjack. It's the game, the only game I understand. Roulette and the this thing. Uh, this is just luck, you know. So I'm not that terribly interested in that. Craps is far above my intellect. I actually took some time with some of the people who came to the book thing afterwards to try to teach me. You know, they were very kind and tried to show me, but I, I, I all I did was get more and more frustrated. I'd play, get frustrated. I would lose, I get more frustrated. I would lose again, and I wasn't getting it. And so, you know, I wrote to my dad actually, and I was like, you know, this must have been invented in your generation when crap was the worst word available because if it were invented today, it would be called motherfucker. <laughs> With that, you know what, Christina, you didn't tell me who our first guest is actually, our first, our first contestant. Is it Tim Young? Oh, I thought it was, oh, Tim, Tim. Hold on. A little bio here. That's right. No, I can't find his bio. All right. This is the best way to introduce somebody. Pretend I'm speaking. You have to speak as if I'm speaking. Oh, okay. uh, your next performer is awesome, and his name is Tim Young. We promise to be even less organized at the next introduction. So, oh, good. Everybody, give it up for Tim Young and his family. Before you ask, uh, I'm so glad you're recording me. That's nice. Uh, a lot of black comics and politicians have hype men. I have a hype choir because I'm white and I'm privileged. Speaking of which, encourage me. That's enough. That's enough. Hey, and you, don't upstage me. <laughs> the Republicans took over Congress this year. I want to talk about that. Let's talk about all the things they've accomplished since they've taken over Congress. What have they done? They continued the budgets. They repassed four laws. And they named a post office. Congratulations, Connellsville, Pennsylvania! Strike two, sunny chap. <laughs> People are complaining that they took the N-word out of classics. They're like, it doesn't make it a classic anymore. It does. But we forget about classics that were made by taking the N-word out. <laughs> the manuscript was a tough read on that one. I don't know. I don't, they actually still use the N-word there. Sorry, I don't know how that got in there. Ooh, you must work there. You're like the one person left and you're white. <laughs> I wasn't always a comic. I actually started off as a, uh, I am actually a professional comic. Sorry guys for the rest of the people in the competition. We'll get to that in a bit. When I kick their asses. Uh, I was actually a campaign manager for Barbara Mikulski until I got fired. She said she wanted to look younger and more hip to like her audience. And I made this commercial and she fired me immediately after she saw the commercial. I saw nothing wrong with it. You guys be the judge. I cracked down because big government shouldn't be funding big banquets with your money. Some people say I'm a bit of a tight rod. I say I'm Barbara Mikulski. Fat bottom girls, you make the rockin' world go round. I didn't see anything wrong with that. I thought she looked hip. She was at like an empty banquet hall, by the way. How sad was that shit? 
Uh, hey, uh, President Obama, there's a nuclear problem in Japan. We've got problems with the economy here. There's so much unemployment. Do you have any advice for us? Uh, I, I think uh, the committee gave them a pretty tough draw here. But I think they're going to beat Texas. I, I, as I That's said, a great game, by the way, Cornell, Wisconsin. This is going to be a great game, but I think Wisconsin pulls it out. Problem solved. You guys are apparently liberal. I was able to get a, a, a hand on a couple of the poster concepts they have for the 2012 election, actually. It's kind of interesting. Uh, they've, they've switched up that hope poster. Uh, take a look at these. Uh, yes, we did. Maybe we shouldn't have. <laughs> Second time's a charm. Can I at least keep the helicopter? And if you don't reelect me, I'll have to go back to Kenya. I'm losing my smile! No! No! I pay you to sing the good parts! You are to bring joy and encouragement to me through Timeless Song, not these people. <laughs> and I thought I told you no one more attractive in this choir than me. You, what's your name? Doesn't matter, get out of here. You're gone. Go. <laughs> Why don't we talk about all the bad things that Muammar Gaddafi's done? Why don't we remember the good times? Like when he started in Growing Pain season three. Show me that smile. Ooh, okay. Show me that smile. Don't waste another minute on your crying. We're nowhere near the end. We're nowhere near the best is ready to begin. Oh, oh, oh. As long as we keep on giving, we can take it. And just in case there are any rebels in the audience, I know the rebels are starting to win and they're celebrating and they're shooting their little guns in the air. Listen, you don't think about where those bullets end up when you shoot those guns in the air. I have though, and there's a chart. You can see something, you hit something, you don't know what you hit. Scientific research. I'm the first one on stage in this competition, right? I don't want my competitors to have any water on stage. Lick the glasses. You saw how quickly I got rid of her. Lick the glasses. There will be no water for any more competitors in this competition. Anybody else want to act up? No? Fine. <laughs> DC used to be called Chocolate City. But one black person in the audience. Oh, there you I'm sorry. Three. I'm auditioning for Showtime at the Apollo this week. True story. Um, that's not funny. That's a cultural tradition. White people laugh at it. See, that's what you hungers get. Um, and so I found this, like, apparently the black population has decreased in D.C. 1% every year. And I found this interesting chart. Um, demographics of D.C. population, 50% African American, 44% uh, white, 4.75% other. And then this was interesting, 0.25% uh, uh, insignificant douchebags who have come into money or moderate popularity through divorce, trust fund, winery, bankruptcy, or moderate slash made-up pageant win, and who play polo because that's what other douchebags do and think that normal people don't understand polo, but we do understand polo 
We understand that it sucks just like they do. And thank God their stupid douchebag TV show, AKA The Real Housewives of DC, was canceled. I have a choir up here, and I've always wanted to do this, and you guys will get to participate now at this point. Um, do it, Rockapella! No, 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 we are called the vocal minority. I really don't give a shit what you're called. Just sing the song! One, two, three, yeah! Well, she sneaks around the world from Kiev to Carolina. She's a sticky fingered filcher from Berlin down to Belize. She'll take you for a ride on a slow boat to China. Tell me where in the world is She go from Nashville to Norway, Bonaire to Zimbabwe, Chicago to Czechoslovakia, and back! Well, she'll ransack Pakistan and run a scan in Scandinavia, then she'll stick them up down under the Wow. That was uh, entertaining, <laughs> educational, and very cruel to our fellow contestants. Tim, I would like to remind you that I have a lot of sway over how this competition goes, and I got something for you to lick. <laughs> you want to win? Our next contestant, Brooke. Brooke, where are you? Brooke Hatfield. Oh, there's Brooke. Brooke, are you finished throwing up? No, not that she's nervous. Brooke is very thin. <laughs> Brooke has a redneck pass and used to be a writer. And she says, until I got tired of sucking. She thinks DC is weird. Let's prove it to her. Brooke. State and dates of people in the fourth estate. Is there a different, oh, wow. How exciting for all of us. So hello, how are you? I don't need water because I have gin, which is great, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to start out by thanking my buddy Mike Riggs. Where are you, buddy? Um, some of you may know him. He works, uh, he works at the Daily Caller and he actually got me involved in this mess because apparently they needed ladies and he isn't one but he recommended me. Um, and I was like, well, Riggs, why are you getting me involved in this and you're not even doing it? And he was like, well, I do it, but I have to do it in drag and my wig has vomit on it. <laughs> so there you go. Mike, as some of you might know, is from the great state of Florida, that flaccid penis of a state. Uh, I understand when Mike was born, the umbilical cord was actually made of whitewashed cut off denim and the afterbirth was orange juice with traces of methamphetamines in it. Yeah. You can get contact high from his farts. That's Mike Riggs for you. But I, I, you know, I can't really diss Mike too much because I also have kind of, as you've heard, a secret redneck past. I'm from a town called Leesburg, Georgia, which if you're familiar with it means you probably know about our railroad track or our novelty hunting and fishing t-shirts with such great phrases as, if fishing were easy, it would be your mom. <laughs> 
Leesburg, Georgia. Come for the white flight. Stay for the vague promise of a Publix. Really stay if you get knocked up your senior year. Mm. But, you know, I, I come from good southern stock. My grandmother has a painting in her house of a trucker leading Jesus, or a, a Jesus leading um, a trucker through a rainy night, which I believe is in the book of Luke, uh, the story of the prodigal trucker. Uh, I moved here a few months ago, actually, from Atlanta, a really sort of terrific, yeah, are you from Atlanta? Where's someone from Atlanta? Did you, you go, my friend. Atlanta is a city on the rise. And in Atlanta, winning the morning means that the homeless dude in a wheelchair smoking a blunt in front of your building tells you you look nice. <laughs> and let me tell you, it is nice to have someone to dress up for sometimes. <laughs> There's not a thing wrong with that. There's not a thing wrong with that. I really like Hill East a lot, actually. My boyfriend lives there. Um, and part of the reason I like it is because it kind of reminds me of some of my favorite parts of Atlanta. It's just a very like, diverse, vital uh, place to live. And I, I work at Washington City Paper, and I subscribe to a variety of listservs uh, for my job, uh, including the Hill East listserv and including the Mount Pleasant and Adams Morgan listservs. Um, those are where I live. And it's sort of interesting to see the discrepancies between the two. Like in Mount Pleasant, the typical listserv email is like, oh, you know, I need a... I need a bilingual nanny share. Does anyone have a, a bilingual nanny they could recommend? But in Hill East, these messages are like, I need a bucket. <laughs> Does anybody have a bucket I could borrow? <laughs> they actually arrested a guy there uh, a few weeks ago who was running through the streets butt-ass naked, high on PCP. And the, co the cops apparently told this sort of concerned citizen who emailed the listserv that PCP was a seasonal drug. So that's good to know. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm really glad I moved to D.C. because if I hadn't moved to D.C., I couldn't go to weird sex toy parties in Maryland. <laughs> that, the commute would have been just awful. Um, a, a very sweet coworker of mine had one of these um, sort of like sex toy sleepover parties at her house. And, you know, I'm down with that. There's nothing wrong with sex positivity. There's nothing wrong with, you know, enhancing that experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this woman showed up with like a, a guitar case full of dildos and this like poo-poo platter of lube, but it was January and she'd left it in her car overnight. <laughs> so it was all frozen. Um, and she also had this uh, like sex toy cleaner that she said got the cat hair off. <laughs> Which I thought was really like, you know, that's good to know, that's very servicey, I appreciate that. So anyway, at one point during this evening, I'm given a Q-tip with gel on either end of it, and I'm told that one, one end of the Q-tip, that gel is intended for my clitoris, and the other end is intended for my vagina, and I was to go into a, an empty bedroom and apply it, and, you know, that's going to, like, sell me on the product or whatever. So I go into this empty bedroom in my, my very kind co-worker's house, and I'm applying this cold gel to my lady bits in Maryland <laughs> and I look up and there's this painting of a clown on a mirror just staring down at me in judgment and this is not a happy clown this is a very sad clown this is a clown that has seen some shit this is a clown this is a clown that killed children in Vietnam and is now the night janitor at a middle school, okay? This is a bummed out clown, and he's looking down at me as I'm putting this weird cold gel on my private parts, and I realize that I'm living that song, Mama Told Me Not To Come. <laughs> if Mama Told Me Not To Come was about sex toy parties in Maryland, which maybe it should have been, I don't know. And sort of like a, an epilogue to this, this gel that I applied to myself made it feel like my vagina had smoked a menthol. <laughs> Which is actually, I think, the natural state of vaginas in Florida. <laughs> so, I'd like to close with a dramatic reading of an email that my father sent me entitled, Sweetening Up a Good Old Boy at the Monster Truck Rally. Just wanted to give you some advice on baiting up a good old boy at the monster truck rally. First, 
You have to know all the catchphrases to you, such as, that dog will hunt. I heard that. Say what? What'd you say? The last two only apply when speaking to him in his shotgun ear. You also may want to wear a fairly short skirt with your cowboy boots to ensure that he knows that you have the kind of legs that he likes, with a foot on one end and a behind on the other. <laughs> In one short dance, he will find out that you meet all the qualifications for true love. You've got a car. You've got a job. You've got money in your pocket. You are single, although that's optional. You've got an apartment. You've got a, ball, a pulse. Boom. He'll fall in love with you automatically. You may want to throw in the fact that your dad has hunting land and lie to him about knowing how to cut up a whole chicken. Good luck, darling. Make sure he shows you respect by spitting before your first kiss. Now, as you may have noticed outside, the cherry blossoms are blooming. So I'm going to go do some PCP. Thank you, guys. Wow. Wow. Is it me or did she seem like a nice girl when she walked up? <laughs> oh my God. Those were the lyrics to pretty much any rap song. <laughs> I wrote some of them down. Lube, vagina, clitoris, dildo, my favorite, lady bits. I have a sudden urge to call my mom. <laughs> the, ne the next contestant is Sean uh, Waterman. No matter what Sean does, Sean, you could come up here and rape a squirrel. <laughs> you're, you're good. She, she pretty much, the bar can't go any lower. Welcome, Sean. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Sean Waterman, and um, I'm an atheist. Any, any other atheists in the house? Yeah? All right, good, good. See you later in the pit of fire. Um, I, uh, my girlfriend's an agnostic. That's, that's like an atheist that's had a heart attack, really, isn't it? But one of the, uh, one of the problems I've noticed uh, over the years with being an atheist, what do you call out when you're coming? Nothing! Oh, nothing! Nothing! Um, luckily, that's, that's not a problem for me because I'm such an egoist that I call out my own name when I climb out. So, um, I'm a reporter and, um, you know, like a lot of my colleagues since September the 11th, I've, with varying degrees of reluctance and enthusiasm, I've been... Uh, writing about terrorism and terrorist threats. And the other day I was at this, uh, I was at a big conference about radicalization and it's winding down at the end of the day and I'm thinking, I find myself thinking, you know, these people are right. This is a really, this is dangerous. I mean, I remember how angry I was as a teenager and now these kids can get on the internet, they can find all this extremist propaganda, uh, they can find out, you know, how to make explosives and so on and they can become lone wolf terrorists. And then it strikes me like a bolt from the blue that I have uh, done what we in the business, and, and by we I mean the English, and by the business I mean colonialism, uh, <coughs> Well, well, I have done what we in the business call going native, which is that I have spent so much time with these, you know, counter-terrorist specialists and these radicalization experts that I've absorbed their value system. I've started to think like they do. Whereas as a reporter, the, as a reporter, the question I should have been asking myself at the end of that day was, where's the bar? So, and um, well, speaking of drinking, uh, my uh, my girlfriend has just uh, given up drinking uh, for a bit, uh, you know, just to detox and, and lose a bit of weight. And I've been I've been supporting her. I've also uh, I've also stopped drinking during the day. Uh, so, so that's worked out for both of us. Mm. But actually, she's not she's not 
technically, she's not my girlfriend anymore because we're going to get married. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now she's my ball and chain to be, uh, or, or fiancé, as, uh, as apparently uh, I'm learning she likes to be called. And there's, all, there's a lot of this, a new terminology, you know, with this wedding stuff, um, you know, that I'm learning now, like wedding surcharge, and the flower arrangement is how fucking much? Um, but I, uh, I uh, you know, I find... Anyone here from working cable news? Anyone? No? Fuck them then. So um, I find personally that, you know, increasingly I find it unwatchable in the United States. Cable news, unwatchable. I mean, there's just, there's just, there's too much opinion. Too much opinion. And I, I mean, you know, as we all know, opinions are like arseholes. Everyone's got one. But do you know another way in which opinions are like arseholes? I don't like to watch them being mouthed by Chris Matthews on television. <laughs> but, um, and it's not a partisan thing, you know, I don't like to watch Bill O'Reilly mouthing them either. Or Rachel, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, one, I, I was watching, I, was, I do have to watch a lot of cable news, unfortunately, you know, in, in my job. And I saw Bill Bennett the other day. Um, who always sort of reminds me of a fat Ted Danson. <laughs> I, saw, I saw Bill Bennett the other day say that apparently more kids than ever are seeking help about marijuana. Really? <laughs> kids? Seeking help about marijuana? What, like, where can I buy some? <laughs> the other thing that, um, you know, that really... I, I find unwatchable is E! News. Anyone ever watch that? E! News? I mean, it's like it apes a real news program. You know, there's six or eight items and you've got to figure the two or three people working all day on each one. So that's like, you know, 20 or 30 people in an office. And I'm watching it and all I can think is how much more entertaining it would be if they just set themselves on fire <laughs> and broadcast that. I'd watch that. Um, another, I mean, you know, with all the unrest in the, uh, in the Middle East these days, I've been watching a lot of uh, Al Jazeera English. Um, it's great. Anyone here watch that? Anyone? Okay. Well, you know then, I mean, it's a great TV channel, but God, do they need some new voiceover people. <laughs> From people making the news. I mean, you know, get, get someone who doesn't sound like the narrator of the Saw movies, for God's sake. <laughs> I did have a moment, actually, with an Al Jazeera reporter the other day when they had just started bombing Tripoli, and she's there, you know, doing a, a live, and she's like, oh, I can hear some, uh, I can hear some uh, explosions and some uh, gunfire behind me. Let me turn round so that the, the microphone can cap the... No! No! I'm like, I'm shouting at the TV. No, don't turn round so that the microphone can capture the sound. Get down. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I mean, bless them, because they're doing uh, difficult and dangerous. Well, it's a lot more dangerous than watching the briefings on the internet in your stretchy pants, which is the way I've been. <laughs> I've been reporting events in Libya recently. Um, <laughs> one of the... Um, one of the things that I find really, I found really difficult to get to grips with in Washington, because, <clears throat> um, you know, as you can tell, I'm not from around here. I live in Adams Morgan. But, <laughs> but one of the things I've had, I've had a real problem with over 10 years, getting to grips uh, in Washington, is the language. And, and I don't mean by that that you all speak some kind of bastardized pigeon English. What I mean is the fact that no one in this town will actually come out and say anything directly. You know, it's all circumlocution and euphemism, like, you know, enhanced interrogation, climate change. It's lovely, isn't it? Change. So, I mean, it's all in one direction, of course, but, but change sounds so much more positive and hopeful, doesn't it, than, than global warming. Um, and, 
you know, there are entire organizations that make a living producing reports full of this sort of circumlocutory bullshit. <laughs> like the, <clears throat> the, uh, the GAO, right? You know, the department's attempts to uh, revive a dead equine with uh, a whip are meeting strategic challenges. <laughs> Translation, you know, DHS's efforts to flog a dead horse are fucking useless. <laughs> or, you know, Hawaii confronting the challenges of sea level change. Translation, 50 years, you're underwater, motherfuckers. <laughs> <clears throat> I, uh, I got a press release the other day for a book called Obama, Politics and Religion. I mean, that's not a book title, is it? That's a list of topics you avoid at a dinner party. <laughs> but, um, but talking of politics, uh, a lot of my Democratic friends very excited uh, about Michelle Bachmann's decision to form a uh, exploratory committee. They, my Democratic friends all, you know, really want her to run. They think she'd be, uh, they think that'd be great for the Democrats. They think that'd help the Democrats win. And I think that's sad because it's not right to take advantage of the mentally ill that way. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to want to uh, 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 finish with a joke, right? So it's the... It's the, uh, it's the fall of, it is the fall of 2004. The presidential election is, uh, is on rushing towards us and the Dalai Lama is taking a walk on the dock of the bay, as you do. When suddenly he sees in the water John Kerry being attacked, the then presidential a candidate for the Democrats, being attacked by a shark. So he gets out his cell phone, he's about to dial 911, when up zooms a huge speedboat, and in the prow are President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney, and they drag Kerry and the shark out of the water and start beating the shark to death with baseball bats. Well, the Dalai Lama's very impressed. He wanders up uh, to the end of the pier and he says to them, my children, that was a karmically beautiful act. You know, you have rescued your political opponent from certain death, and you will be rewarded on the wheel of life. And off he goes. So Bush turns to Cheney and he says, who the fuck was that, Dick? <laughs> Cheney says, that, sir, Mr. President, that was the Dalai Lama, the reincarnation of the living Buddha, and the most enlightened human being on the face of the earth. And Bush says, is that right? He doesn't know much about shark fishing, though. How's the bait? <laughs> well done. Well done, Sean. I do wonder how much of that would have been funny without that great accent, though. Dalai Lama. I, said, I know that's exactly what I'm going to be saying when I wake up tomorrow morning in that way. Dalai Lama. Um, our next, oh, by the way, in case you're wondering, the contestant before that, Brooke, is, was just caught in a stall with four reporters. Uh, <laughs> stress relief, I guess, after her bit. <clears throat> our next contestant is Nadia Bilbasi, and she is it's a very unusual combination. Nadia is Irish-Palestinian, which means she's too drunk to find the cord to blow herself up. So. <laughs> My God, how am I going to keep up with all the previous performances? But they were brilliant, and I can't even drink because they licked the glasses. I can't, I can't have a, a glass of gin because I'm a Muslim, I can't drink. It's a lie, actually, the bar was closed. Um, <laughs> but anyway, and I can't say anything with the F word because they're all X-rated and it's not really good from an Arab girl who comes from a conservative family. That's a lie, too. But anyway, um, 
the reason I'm here actually because a friend of mine told me there is a comedy show in Washington tonight. And I said, a comedy show in Washington? Is this a joke? She said, no, it's real. So I said, like, Washington and funny? Washington and comedy in the same sentence? Can't be true. Like, Washington and alter ego? Maybe. Washington, I'm the most influential person? Maybe. Um, but anyway, as it happens, you persuaded to come here, and um, you have to laugh, regardless if my jokes are lame, but, you know, I have to get some kind of award for being courageous to stand here in front of massive audience. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I love this. I can do it again, actually. This is the first time I'm standing up as a stand-up comedian. But anyway, the reason I'm doing it, actually, is because for charity. She told me it's for charity, and I said, I'll do anything for charity, almost anything. Not, not exactly. <laughs> so the last time I got involved in charity, I got another friend who said to me, Nadia, um, I'm building a school in Kenya. And I really wanted you to help. And I said, sure. What do you want me to do? And she said, um, can you auction yourself? And I said, what? She said, like, auction yourself? Now, this is for those of you who speak Arabic. It doesn't translate well in Arabic at all. <laughs> <coughs> so I said, um, yeah, you know. And then after I said yes, I said, like, what the heck did I do? Anyway, so um, I went to the auction. I, I have very low expectation, and I said, the hell with it. So if nobody bid on me, it's okay. It's not a big deal. You know, I don't have a big ego. It's fine. I'll cry over now, but it's okay. I will survive. But funny enough, I actually surprised myself. I raised the highest amount of money. Can you believe it? <laughs> now, it's not, I can't, I can't compete with President Obama fundraising. It was like $700, all right? <laughs> But I tried to entice the audience. I said, come on, I'll, 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 do, I'll take you to a briefing at the White House. How lame is that? Anyway. But actually, we raised money, and I was very pleased. So when we finished, I said to the organizer, so who, who's the guy? And she said, a guy? And I said, yeah, the guy who bid on me. She said, uh, he's not a guy. I said, what, what do you mean? He's a woman? She goes, uh, no, it's not a woman. I said, it's not a man, and it's not a woman, what is it? She said, they're actually a couple. And I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> now, by then I got really nervous. I said, a couple? She goes, um, yeah. So I said, oh. Uh, she said, actually, it's not just a couple. It's a couple and eight people. <laughs> I said, what? A couple and eight people? She goes, yeah. They actually, I have kind of to break the news to you. And by then, I was sweating, right? And she said, they didn't bet on you. And I said, what do you mean? She said, they bet on the prize that you come with. And I said, what? <laughs> and apparently, because everybody else, all the other girls, you know, young and beautiful, they just like, they give them a prize of like uh, making pizza for two people at an Italian restaurant or, you know, a lesson in mountain climbing. But mine was at a, a dinner for 10 people at an ambassador's house. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it's two and eight, so it makes sense. Anyway, so <laughs> but it was for charity. And I said, yeah, OK, I'll do it. And we got the money, and everybody was happy. Anyway, um, well, being in Washington or being in America, you know, it's, it's really nice because you guys are very much proud of who you are. And for me, it's always tough, because people ask me, where are you from? And I say, um, I'm from Palestine. And people say, very often, they say, where is that? <laughs> and I say, kind of, uh, kind of close to Lebanon, Jordan, Syria. And if I'm brave enough in the right circle, I say, kind of, it's occupied by the Israelis, you know? <laughs> um, but very often, they will say, um, Pakistan? I said, like, no, no, it's Palestine. So I kind of, I grew up in developing a hobby, which is collecting passports. Because, you know, when you don't have a state, you're trying to compensate somehow. <laughs> so actually, I do collect passports. It's a hobby. And I have them here. It's not a joke. So I have the first one. It's a genuine one. You can all look at it afterwards. It's Irish! See? <laughs> it's the best passport you can have. 
You have no colonial history. You love to drink. You know, any country gives you a visa for three months, so it's great. And actually, it, it doesn't expire very often, but it's full of stamps. So I can travel all over the world, and I get another one, etc. So this is great. Anyway, and I got another one here. And it's also genuine. Any guesses? Green? No, it's Somali! <laughs> it's actually a Somali passport. So when I used to be a war correspondent, which is much easier than standing in front of you here, <laughs> give me a war any day. <laughs> and I used to go to Mogadishu before, you know, everybody now talks about the Shibab and the Jihadist and all. I used to do the warlords. So my cameraman would say, I'm going to the market. Well, what do you like? And I say, uh, just get us some cigarettes and, you know, some fruit. And, and he said, a passport? I said, what? He says, a passport. And I said, what do you mean? He said, 25 bucks. I get you a genuine Somali passport. <laughs> and it's true. You just have to provide the photo. So you give him a photo of you, any photo you want, and he goes to the market, and he buys you a genuine Somali passport. They're actually true. I mean, during the Siad Bari government, they had actually printed passports, but they didn't use them. They were like had too many of them. So they're selling them in the market. Typical Somali entrepreneurial kind of spirit, like, what do you sell? <laughs> Passports. The only thing you have to do is to fill the details. So you can write your profession, your name, your address. You can write anything. But actually, it works. Anyway, so I have a second passport here. And uh, since I've been here eight years, and my son is just finishing first year of pre-med. And uh, <laughs> he decided that America is, of course, half Palestinian, quarter Irish, quarter English, half Christian, half Muslim, growing up in America. So this is the best place for him. So he said, like, America, yes, I want to be an American. So I said, OK, well, after he finished, and he needs a job, obviously, so he's going to stay here. So I decided that, yeah, I'm going to become an American citizen. So I apply for a green card. So actually, I got a green card, except that it's not green. It's white. <laughs> For most of you have probably never seen a green card, but actually, it's white. But anyway, still, they call it the green card. So um, I got a green card, and I, you have to apply in your home country to come back to America, although you live in here, but you still have to go to Dublin, because it's my home country, right? <laughs> I look very Irish, you know, you can't mistake in me. <laughs> my red hair, my prickles, my accent, talking about accents. Oh, he's not here. Anyway, so, um, so I come back from a long flight from Dublin to Dallas Airport. And many of you have seen these immigration officers. I don't know what school they go to, but they always tell them, never smile, you know, never be nice, you know. So I arrive at Dallas Airport really tired, you know, makeup running, you know, look really dreadful, tired and exhausted. And the guy looked at me, he goes, so ma'am, excuse the accent, okay, I can't do the accents. He says like, so ma'am, you have a green card? And I said, yeah. And he said, your husband is American? I said, no, I don't have a husband, actually. And he said, uh, are you parents who are American? I said, no, they're all dead. Actually, I'm an orphan, I don't have parents. It's true, by the way. And um, he said, so how did you get it? And I said, EB1? So you, probably most of you don't know what's EB1, right? EB1 is extraordinary ability. Yes. <laughs> Actually, there is a category. It's called EB1. And you can get a green card if you prove that you're an asset to the United States. So you can be an athlete or a scientist. Or like me, a bridge kind of thing between East and West, the Muslim world and America. You know, objective, authentic reporting, etc. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Anyway, but I got it. Actually, I got a recommendation from the White House and the State Department, and I got the green card. So he looked at me. He was a very serious guy. He kind of put his glasses. He looked at me. He said, extraordinary ability. And I said, mm-hmm. And he said, can you make the wall move? <laughs> and I said, I'm not that extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, it was nice of him. <laughs> anyway, 
I'm really excited about what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, they talk about Gaddafi and he did this performance, you know, but I'm so proud for a long time to be an Arab. Yes, we're making it. We're making history. So I always tell my son, you have to be very proud of your heritage. Look at us. We invented algebra, the numbers. Without us, you guys would be, eh, not nothing, but, you know, can't figure out certain things. And he kind of not impressed at all. He looked at me and he says, uh, okay, so you invented algebra? I said, like, yeah, we did. And he said, how many thousand years ago was that? And it's true, we just have nothing else to show for, unfortunately. <laughs> but now there's great hope. There's a new revolutions everywhere. And when it started in Tunisia, I was so excited. The only thing I was kind of didn't like, it happened in the winter. I have to wrap. God, I thought it was five minutes on. Oh. Okay, I was worried because everybody spoke for so long. I said, oh my God, how am I going to fill my time? They only five minutes. Okay, I'm almost finished. So he said, <laughs> I, I kind of read your body language, but I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. All right. You make me forget what I was going to say now. You know, I have the worst memory in the world. It's not good being a journalist. Anyway. So, um, yeah, I was very excited about Tunisia, because the only problem, it happened in the winter. So I wanted to be like the Prague Spring, you know. It was like winter of discontent, eh, maybe. But anyway, I'm glad now it's going on and on and on. It's just like, oh, my God, can't keep up with the news, you know, just like started in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, God knows where, everywhere. Anyway, um, I have time, right? <laughs> Two minutes? Uh. Okay, one, one last <laughs> joke, one political joke. <laughs> See, journalists can talk, you never knew that. Um, so I was, um, I was in Costa Rica recently. What's that to do with the Middle East, you know? I was supposed to be like in Libya or in Egypt or anyway. I was uh, moderating a panel about the Middle East and Latin American alliance. How to think out of the box, find a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian question. And I loved Costa Rica because, uh, I don't know many of you know, but it doesn't have an army. Do you know that? Yeah, doesn't have an army. So it was my model. I said, that's great. This is how I want to model a Palestinian state. We don't need an army. Who needs an army, you know? The money that you spend on defense budget, you can build the best schools and the best art theaters, the best hospitals, you know? And you're gonna compete with nuclear Israel? You kidding me? Anyway, but now since this is happening in the Middle East, I kind of changed my mind because the first thing the Americans ask when it happened in Egypt, where is the army? We need the army, we need to talk to the army. We give them $3 billion, you know? So I thought if we have a Palestinian state, we need, we need to overthrow the government, we need to talk to the army. So maybe we need an army after all. <laughs> anyway, last thing, which is the last interview, actually, who, who, whoever thought of what's happening in the Middle East, you have to credit President Bush. So the last interview I did with him, yeah, I have to brag, it was 35 minutes and he invited me to the Oval Office and he talked about the Middle East. And he said, you know, I, I have really an optimistic vision about the Middle East. And I said, oh, yeah, Mr. President, I thought he's going to talk in details about foreign policy. And he said, yeah, look at the carpet. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, look at the carpet. It's very bright. This is how I think the future of the Middle East is going to look like, bright like my carpet. Thank you so much. I took too much time. That, <clears throat> not, that was adorable. <laughs> That's the cutest stand-up routine I've ever seen. <laughs> it, your interview with Bush was a fraction of how long it took you to talk about your interview with Bush. <laughs> Oh, wow. What are we doing? It's, a, it's called winning by attrition. The, the other comedians have died <laughs> of old age. It was very, that was good. We had, a, we had an ethnically based, an ethnically based bit, which is good. I'm Greek, uh, as my name probably betrays, and um, as you all know, Greece is in a rough shape. Yet, yet, I still think it's a good time to be Greek, when I look at the news, the stuff that she was just talking about, the Middle East, you know, of course, the Jewish-Palestinian thing, 
problem we have with Catholics and stuff like that. I think, you know, we as Greeks should, we should take out, we should take out ads. We won't steal your land. We won't blow up your buildings. We won't rape your kids. We're Greeks. <laughs> There's going to be a very, uh, very short intermission. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back here. We'll meet our judges and we'll continue with our contestants. Take your seats. Take your seats. Take your seats. Wow. There we go. Who would have known? Conservative Washington. Given one intermission, they turned into Cirque du Soleil. Okay, we're running a little bit long, but. We're having a nice time, so we're going to get right to our next contestant. Meredith, hold on. Yeah. Well, let's see. Yes. Oh, Meredith. Meredith Shiner is a Chicago area native who wishes she were the brains behind the fake Rahm Emanuel Twitter. As you've just learned, Meredith is not funny. No! That's what Meredith wrote. That's what she wrote. I'm going to sit up here with you, Meredith. Are you with Brooke? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Meredith Shiner. It's nice to have friends in the crowd. It's like showing up for the SAT. You get 500 points for signing your name. I'm a nerd. I can't help it. Sorry. Um, so, actually, the other thing that I'd like to share is that I was a little bit afraid that I might get fired after tonight. So the great thing is that when you're in D.C. and you say that in a room, you get a business card from a lawyer. It's fantastic. <laughs> Seriously, true story. Thank you. I appreciate it. My, my bosses might not. I feel like I have more license now. Anyway, uh, as you may know, my name is Meredith Shiner. I'm a reporter for Politico. It's okay, you don't have to clap. I, that was the lamest woo ever, it's fine. Um, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit nervous. I've never done this before, but if I had a dollar for every time a guy in DC told me that line, I'd have some funds to go with that pittance of a reporter salary I've got. Um, so, Speaking of lines in DC men, God, that was a flawless transition. I wonder who wrote it. Um, I'm not that funny. So what I wanted to do is take this opportunity to render a public service to the men of DC. You see, you guys aren't so smooth. You think you're really smooth, but you're not. And the thing is, is I go out and it doesn't matter. I avoid Georgetown, duh. But like, I go out and I get these lines and it's just like, dudes, you're not that cool. So here's the thing. Here's my gift to all of you men in the crowd. Um, lines that I, Meredith Shiner, never ever want to hear from you DC men because they're just not going to work. Listen, I don't want to wanna go to war with you. I'm just looking for some quick kinetic military action. I'll drive your conversation. Yes, we can. <laughs> can I put lipstick on your pig? Hope I'm not a toad, winky face emoticon. I'm a very fit, fun, classy guy. Are you a tranny? I'll make, I'll make like a senator with a motion to rise if you'll be my amendment and laid, made and laid upon the table. Again, sorry, nerd, can't help it. Hi, I'm Dan Snyder. <laughs> Look at that, there's a lot of Washington City paper people in the crowd. That's Show me your tweets. I have to be honest. I love America too much to ever be faithful to you. <laughs> Do you like my vineyard vines? Your name's Monica? No, it's Meredith. Oh, that's a shame. I've always wanted a Monica. Ladies? I've seriously heard that one. It's bad, multiple times. And the joke was bad, apparently. God, tough crowd. 
I want to be the man DC wakes up to. <laughs> oh, that, it took you guys some time. <laughs> I'm you. Shit, I always forgot to put the in in there. God. <laughs> I'll show you my red badge of courage. Hey, baby, let me be the Steve King to your Michelle Bachman. Michelle Bachman in the crowd. How do you feel about the Appalachian Trail? And by the Appalachian Trail, I mean Argentina. <laughs> it's a big fucking deal. <laughs> I work for Politico. <laughs> so, speaking of, thank you, thank you, I do. Uh, since October 2009, that's like 80 years in Politico years. Um, so, I talked to some of my colleagues. I'm a, I'm a congressional reporter uh, for Politico. I'm on the Hill. I cover the Senate. Um, there are a lot of dudes who cover the Hill for Politico. And uh, I talked to them. I'm like, you know, I'm doing this stand-up routine. Meredith, you're not funny. I don't understand why you're doing this. But please don't make a joke about me. So, OK, fine. Um, I decided that I was going to do a generic impersonation of a generic Politico reporter slash Hill reporter, just so you can get an idea of you know what we deal with, what it's like, what it's like to be cool and winning the morning. Um, so, any amorphous time of day, I feel like I'm winning right now. I'm trained to do it. Um, so I'm gonna get. You know, I have a costume, and actually, I'm not good at this whole one woman show thing. So I've got some um, cue cards for you guys, and you're gonna help set the table for this story. So just give me two seconds. I I, I gotta like. in my mind. Fuck you. No one wants this morning. Why am I sick? Because I lost a spot that on which lap is going to end up being the Hill's 20 most beautiful people. <laughs> no, no, you don't. You won't, let me tell you something. No one reads that publication, first of all. Second of all, I don't need to see her picture in the paper, because she's totally into the Hill Mary. I'm like the touchdown thesis. <laughs> no? Because I woke up this morning and I saw my story, my exclusive in the Daily Caller. I was supposed to break the news of Daryl Ice's morning shit. <laughs> no? You know what? You know what? I don't need you. I'm gonna call so I'm gonna call one of my colleagues at the world headquarters and we're gonna double byline a story about Bo the first dog, and guess what? It's gonna get more hits than a commuter song in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't need you. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Well, next time you got a leak that you wanna you we got a release that you wanna leak, just you know who to call. <laughs> Sorry, Bobcat last one. Uh, okay, so I'm a believer in short and sweet, so I'm gonna one last joke, it's about Twitter, because Twitter's a joke. And in fact, if you guys weren't all so busy tweeting all my smart one-liners, I feel like I would get more laughs, right? It's true, you probably are, I hope. Please, I, I actually don't tweet all that stuff about Politico. I don't want it to get out so soon. I gotta probably do damage control first. Um, so Twitter, 
I don't really like it, although I tweet all the time, so I guess I'm a huge hypocrite, but I live in DC, so whatever. Um, <laughs> Twitter. If I ran the world, Twitter would only have three people. Ozzy Guillen, Buzz Bissinger, and fake Ma Rahm Emanuel, because there'd be more fucks in one hour of that feed than everyone in this room has had the last decade combined. <laughs> All right, that's my, that's my shtick. I'll have to clean up my stuff now, but thank you guys very much. Wow. The guys can't hold the candle to the uh, mouth on these women tonight. <laughs> I said, the guys are all, well, there was the one guy who was obsessed with his penis. But, but <clears throat> Always like a woman who leaves a mess. <laughs> Meredith Shiner is very funny. And Meredith Shiner was complaining about dating in, uh, oh, you have, apparently we have props. Not props at work, but we have props. Our next, you know, while he's setting this up, let me introduce our judges. Our judges, right up front here, are last year's co-winners of this very same competition. They are Jamie McIntyre. who used to be really big. <laughs> and Rich Edson of the Fox Business News Channel. And they're having the time of their lives tonight, aren't you? It's on, I think it's on. Oh, here you go, but you can borrow mine. Mine is always on, Jamie. Hey there. Um, thank you. I got to say, uh, it's going to be really tough this year because the bar has truly been raised in terms of, uh, of comedic uh, enterprise. And uh, I just I told Rich it's a, it's a darn good thing, and I use darn, I'm sorry, I'm going blue here, but uh, I it's a darn good thing that we're not competing this year because uh, I don't even think we'd make the top five. Uh, Rich? Uh, uh, right. There you go. <laughs> you can see why he was named the co-funniest reporter in D.C. Anyway, on with the show. Enough about, it's not really about me. Oh, actually, well, it could be. No, it's not really about me. And you're doing a terrific job. Right? Our next competitor is going to take 20 more minutes to set up. And then do a minute and a half song. <laughs> but it'll really be worth it. Right, John? John won't even acknowledge me. He's that pissed. John Kelly is from Washington, but not of Washington. Everybody, John Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I'm glad I didn't invite my kids to come tonight. I was thinking about that. but. Uh it's pretty blue, yeah, and you probably, this is the first time I've worn this sweater, by the way, so it, <laughs> I might break out later. Uh, you probably know me from my column in the Washington Post and my charity work, the gay porn I did in college, you might, some of you remember that. Um, what you might not know is that I consider myself first and foremost a musician. Uh, a troubadour in the uh, tradition of Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan and Leonard. Um, Leonard, is is he that 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 guy with the horsey face from Canada who can't really sing? Yeah, him, Leonard Cohen. Um, telling stories through song, trying to make the world a better place. I know that sounds conceited, but I don't think it is. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to make the world a better place. We're going to try to do that tonight. For the last few years, I've been working on a song cycle that pretty much tells the history of the Washington Post, where I work. From the beginning of the Post, 18, 
uh, 77 when it was founded by Stilson Hutch Hutchins all the way through uh, you know, the 1880s, 1890s. You know what comes next, 1900s. Um, <laughs> Up, you know, Teapot Dome, uh, Pentagon Papers, Katie's Tit in a Ringer, all the way up, Watergate, everything. It's going to be about eight hours long. This, uh, it's an American musical, pretty much. One-man show type of thing. It's got things like this. And here's to you, Eugene Robinson. Krauthammer hates you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God bless you, please, Eugene Robinson. You're the only sane thing on the page. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. I'm a drummer, actually. <laughs> Anybody here know Patrick Paxton? Is, Pat, is Patrick Paxton here? Are, are, you're not Patrick Paxton, are you, lady? Patrick Paxton, he sounds like a character in a Marvel comic, Patrick Paxton. He, he's actually the Post's new uh, ombudsman, but he sounds like, you know, Patrick Paxton got bitten by a radioactive spider and he became the ombudsman. He replaced, <laughs> he replaced the old ombudsman who was named Andy Alexander, which I'm pretty sure is the copy boy at the Daily Planet. <laughs> I don't know where we get these guys. Anyway. This song. This song is for Patrick Paxton. I wish he was here, and he probably is glad he isn't. <laughs> oh, hang on, I've got to be able to see it because I, I just wrote it today. Hey there, ombudsman, what it's like in your new job? From my office down the hallway, I can hear the angry mob that's come for you. Now you know why the old ombudsman's through. Yes, you do. Hey there, ombudsman, don't you worry about the death threats. I'm sure that they don't mean it, though you might just want to keep your pets inside. And buy yourself a nice disguise so you can... Oh, it's such a thankless job. 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 Oh, a thankless job. Hey there, ombudsman. I'm sure that it's not easy. Defending all our typos and a website that's so cheesy to the crowd. You're hiding under your desk is not allowed. You should be proud. Hey there, ombudsman, I'm so glad that I'm not you. Praise the newsroom, readers hate you. Criticize us, we hate you. What can you do? Bless you. Either way, you end up screwed. That can't be good. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Clap along, yeah. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Big bit here. A thousand emails sounds like a lot when they all spot a left-wing plot. Except the ones who think we've gone far right. Then they say we plagiarize, we make things up, we tell big lies. I don't know how you will sleep at night. Sure, we said Nixon was a crook, but after that came Janet Cook. And you're the guy who has to set things right. Yeah, that's your plight. Sweater's getting to be. Hey there, ombudsman, don't you dare read how we curse. He's just the kind of bastard who will hit you where it hurts, and that's too bad. Sort of like a punching bag for anyone who's mad. Hey there, ombudsman, I guess there is no prescription.
subscription for all the folks who call you up just to cancel their subscription and complain. Yeah, your job is filled with pain. I'm just saying. Hey, yeah. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Oh, it's such a thankless job. Ready? Oh. Such a thankless job. Thank you. So that's, that's one of the songs I'm working on for this song cycle. Um. <laughs> that was pretty good there. Um, did anybody bring a drum set? This is kind of a classic song. You might, I want you to sing along with this one like you did in the last one. <laughs> 7 a.m. waking up in the morning, gotta be fresh, gotta go downstairs. Gotta have my bowl, gotta have cereal. Seeing everything, the time is going. Ticking on and on, everybody's rushing. Gotta get down to the bus stop. Gotta catch my bus, I see my friends. Kicking in the front seat, sitting in the back seat. Gotta make my mind up, which seat can I take? Cause it's Friday, Friday, I gotta get down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. Friday, Friday, getting down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. Party and party and party and party and Fun, 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 looking forward to the weekend. 7.45, we're driving on the highway, shooting so fast, I want time to fly. Fun, fun, think about fun, you know what it is. I got this, you got this, my friend is by my right. I got this, you got this, now you know it. Kicking in the front seat, sitting in the back seat, gotta make my mind up, which seat can I take? down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. Friday, Friday, getting down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the week. All together. Party and party and party and party and fun, 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 fun. Looking forward to the weekend. Hang on. Yesterday was Thursday. Friday, we, 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 we so excited, we so excited, we gonna have a ball today, tomorrow is Saturday, and Sunday comes after that, I don't want this weekend to end. Well done. That was awesome. <clears throat> that was amazing. 
God. We've had, we've had a choir. We've had guitars. We've had cue cards. We've had that woman from Georgia. And, and I think you know what I mean by we've had that woman from Georgia. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I love the props. I love, I, I, like I said, I just came back from a book tour where I did a little slideshow thing, and it, it brings a different kind of interaction with the crowd. I'll, I'll tell you about this one cartoon real quick before we get to the wonderful Jamila Bay. Um, I flashed the cartoon. It was a vegetarian cartoon, and it was of uh, <clears throat> a lion wearing a ball gown and was talking to an alligator at some party, and they were making fun of omnivores. Fine. Someone from the audience raised their hand and says, um, the cartoon is fine, uh, but if you really wanted to be accurate, instead of a lion and an alligator, that would be a lion and a crocodile, because both of them live in Africa. <laughs> so let me get this right. <clears throat> it's perfectly reasonable that I've drawn a lion standing on two legs, wearing a ball gown, a string of pearls, holding a glass of wine at a cocktail party, talking to a reptile, <laughs> but you have a problem about what continent they're on. Okay. Uh, as I said, we've had all of these things. We've had all kinds of props and licking the props and, and other stuff like that. And I was looking over at Jamila Bay, who was a moment ago stretching. <laughs> She's a little like doing calisthenics, so I have no idea what is coming next. Without further ado, Jamila Bay. Oh, Jamila. 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 I know. We've <laughs> it's going around. Jamila Bay. Jamila Bay. The Susan Lucci. Lucci spelled phonetically. L O O C H E E. She either wants me to get this, or she thinks I'm a moron. <coughs> Jamila Bay, the Susan... <coughs> Galifianakis Bay. <laughs> the Susan Lucci... The name will get you farther. The Susan Lucci of Comedia del Media is pissed off tonight. Well, I guess... You that tells us what's coming next. <laughs> I was, and we know what the calisthenics are about. <clears throat> not only does she not get to bring her gorgeous baby up here for an easy laugh. I'm assuming you're talking about a child and not a significant other. It could be a baby or it could be a baby. Uh, she can't bring her gorgeous baby up here for an easy laugh, but she also hasn't gotten her drink tickets. <clears throat> and look at the order of importance. Her child and then the alcohol. Jamila Bay. Tim Young, this one's for you. I brought my own. You wish. <laughs> um, hey, hey. Thank you. Um, uh, to got, g g g thank you, host. Yay. <laughs> Isn't he awesome? Isn't he awesome? Okay, so. Hi, I am Jamila Bay, and uh, I am a freelance journalist. Oh, forgive me. Um, okay, thank you, set director. 
Uh, Jamila Bay here. I'm a freelance journalist, which is to say I am job hunting, y'all. I have cards and resumes uh, and links to my audio work in the back. See me after. Thank you so much. Um, it's just that right now it's hard for me to find a job because of my record. Um, <laughs> not on the charts. I, I did a 10-year sentence at NPR. And <laughs> NPR, NPR, um, have they been in the news lately? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, NP uh, you try, you try, these people don't get it. Here's the deal, how is it that people who are in the business of communicating are so bad at communicating? <laughs> really, really. <sighs> The headline that said it best said, they brought a tote bag to a knife fight. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, you know, it, it's like, and, and I, no kidding, I did 10 years there. I mean, the, the, the rarefied air, the pure air that they have been breathing have come back to bite them in the ass. Just ah, right in the back there. Because the problem is, you've got a building full of these people with funny names. We won't go into them all here. Some of them are still my friends. But all these people with funny names, these highfalutin educations, and they have no idea how to see again and recognize bullying when it happens when they're adults. What part don't they get? Did, didn't anybody, I mean, hasn't anybody seen that video on YouTube with the uh, little, well, he's not that little, the, uh, yeah, the, the kid from Australia, Casey Haynes. Yeah, like, okay, so for those of you who haven't seen it, these bullies videotaped their victim. Casey, he's, you know, a chubby 12-year-old. And this skinny little boy runs up and he's dancing, you know, he's smacking him in the head. And, you know, and, and, you know, Casey is turning and not giving them what they want. And then finally, he picks up this skinny little runt and pile drives him right into the cement. <laughs> no guns, no knives. NPR, take a note, please, please. You know, uh, here, here, here's NPR. National Public Radio. We're going to take away all your federal funding. That's only 8% of our budget. We don't care, so what? <laughs> I'm going to ignore you. National Public Radio, you suck. Well, that's typical. We're going to be the bigger people here. And by the way, the name's not National Public Radio. We've changed it. It's NPR. Get it right. And then finally the blows comes like, oh, we lost our senior vice president. Oh, our president's gone. Oh, I, well, we have another eye to see out of. Can you please stop hitting us, Juan? You used to be our friend, Juan Williams. Why are you doing this out? <laughs> and it's like, really? Re watch YouTube. They have the, you, you get tutorials, how to beat up a bully. NPR needs to, needs to get up and watch some of this. So, you know, here, here's my problem, though. NPR has a network full of people who can turn a phrase until it bends over and fillets itself. <laughs> Yet they don't know how to respond to this. You know, and, and I, just, I just feel like, really, so it, it's so easy to see, and I'm going to tell you what to do, but I just want to remind them you, you don't need a tote bag. You've got Nina Totenberg, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you about Nina Totenberg. No lie, this is totally real. She got run over by a speedboat. <laughs> she was hacked apart by the propeller on the boat and was at work a week later. <laughs> the woman is impervious to the scourge that has wiped out the Florida manatee. What the hell can Fox News do to her? You know, I'm going to tell you right here, right now. Here is how to save NPR. Don't even have to, like, you know, give me any favors. This one is a gift from me. <laughs> With a tote bag. <laughs> okay, so you call in the troops. 
you go after the children. Get your friends at Sesame Street and use the hell out of that little red monster. Okay, here we go. To the table read. Elmo, standing next to Snuffleupagus, looking at Big Bird in his nest. Big Bird is not moving. Okay, here we go. Snuffy, how's it looking, Elmo? <laughs> it not look good for Big Bird. The Republicans don't want us to be friends anymore, children. They're going to kill Big Bird first and then come for Elmo. <laughs> then the count runs through, waving a feather. Ha 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 ha, one feather, one feather lost. When Big Bird loses 10 feathers, he dies. Ha 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 Exit the count. Snuffy asks, why, Elmo? Oh, oh sorry, Snuffy. Get, get my voice right. Why, Elmo? <laughs> the Republican Congress say, too much money go to feed Big Bird all that bird seed. And if you and I friends, children, you care if Big Bird starve to death. But since Elmo loved Big Bird, like Elmo love you. Elmo love you. Elmo sad. The count again runs through. Two, ha 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 ha, two feathers lost. Back to Snuffy. Oh dear, what can we do? Dr. Terry Gross, do you have any ideas? <laughs> Hello, wait, hold on. Terry voice. <clears throat> Hello, children. I'm Dr. Terry Gross. And when I'm not hosting fresh air, <laughs> I'm trying to save Big Bird. <laughs> I'm trying to keep him alive. The only hope is to tell your parents to call the numbers at the bottom of your screen right away <laughs> and pledge $100 or as much as they can to save Big Bird. Dr. Terry Gross, if Big Bird saved, can Elmo live? You know what I'm going to say. Come on, you know. Yes, Elmo. <laughs> Saving Bird now means that nobody will come and kill you later. <laughs> but you need to act now, children. Tell your parents to not vote for any more Republicans. That would kill Big Bird. That would kill Elmo. That could even kill you. <laughs> and that, my friends, is how you save NPR. You heard it here first. I'm Jamila. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. Jamila Bay. Wow. Otherwise known as Bitterness with Gusto. <laughs> Holy smokes. I don't think you exponentially increase the chances of your getting a job in this town tonight. <laughs> wow. This is interesting. But you kept it local, which is actually what I thought the the thrust of some of this was going to be, the, lo the local uh, stuff. I have a local issue. As somebody who dates here and is a relationship cartoonist <laughs> and was married to the country's preeminent advice columnist, I don't have normal dates. Sometimes they come into it with information, you know, because they see my cartoons and they think they know how my mind works and you know I'm sitting across from invariably I'm just trying to have a nice time on a first date and then be like you know don't you? <laughs> you you're a really sensitive guy 
you understand a woman's mind. And I'm just like, there's no chance of getting laid at this point. <clears throat> I have to be all evolved. I have to listen well, make eye contact, talk about chick movies. You know, they never lust after a guy. They want to marry me. And they don't ever lust after me. Or they're very frank because they feel like we've seen it all. They, say, they can say anything right off the bat, first date. I don't have uh, sex for at least three months. Okay, well, I call you in three months then. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> our, ne <laughs> our next contestant is Mike Walter. <laughs> Mike Walter is back. All of the comedians, all the contestants tonight are giving me little notes, so I'm reading for you guys. Mike Walter is back after performing here two years ago. He is the former morning anchor on Channel 9, so at least you know it's not past his bedtime right now. <laughs> Mike Walter, everybody. It's true. I was here two years ago, and I just left Channel 9, you know, and at that time, a lot of people were saying, Mike, you got to miss it. you got to miss anchoring. You miss anchoring, don't you? Even today, people say to me, Mike, you miss anchoring, don't you? And I'll be honest with you. There is one thing I do miss. I miss the opportunity to show you my inflections. <laughs> it's not as bad now as it was right after I left the station. You know, I, I was at home, a lot of depressing days, sitting around, it'd be 5.58 at night, be sitting at the chair, dinner's almost ready. Suddenly I'd jump up and I'd say, coming up tonight at 6, dinner, on the menu, chicken. Can it cause salmonella? It has in the past, details to follow. And I'd say, later, dessert. Will one family be facing obesity? We'll find out in 20 years. <laughs> and then I'd say, just into the kitchen, breaking news, the children are home. <laughs> we begin with team coverage. Our senior correspondent, because she is a senior, Courtney. Courtney? Well, we're having problems with our audio once again. <laughs> Let's toss it to Trevor. Trevor. Well, I guess it's time to go to one of our sponsors. And since I'm not working anymore, that's, of course, my lovely bride and your mother, Kate. When you have real estate needs, whether it's buying or selling, call Kate. Kate? For the love of God, stop. Please stop. Stop. I'm begging you. My family had problems. <laughs> I don't have any problems. My family, they had problems. They didn't understand, and you probably don't understand, anchors are like athletes, okay? A great athlete will remember that clutch bucket, you know, that home run. We remember those inflections. I'll take you back in time. 1989, Bay Area earthquake. Music starts. Dun 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 dun. Aerial shot. Bridge collapse. My turn to speak. <laughs> I get the lead. They're calling it a concrete pancake of death. <laughs> I completely nailed it. I remember that moment. I was in my element. Then I did something that's totally uncharacteristic of anchors, something I kicked myself for later. I began to think. <laughs> and I started thinking, are they really calling it that? <laughs> and if they're calling that, why did they choose a breakfast food item? Lord knows if they were here at the National Press Club, it would be, they're calling it a traumatic taco of terror. 
especially on Fridays. NPC people get that. No one else does. We've got about three of them here tonight, I can tell. I was thinking maybe a better start would have been, it's a fajita freeway of fear and fatalities. <laughs> but I stuck with the pancake thing. You know, the, uh, the inflections, I mean, they helped me. I got here to Washington, D.C. I was on the air for six years. And I could never get traction. I couldn't understand it. And then finally it dawned on me one day. Inflections don't matter here. They don't matter. They don't. And I'll give you a prime example of that. Uh, the number one anchor in this market, he hasn't had an inflection in 43 years. <laughs> I'm talking about Jim Vance. <laughs> Jim Vance would be on the air, the music would be dun -ta dun -ta dun -ta dun -ta dun dun I like that music. And he'd come on and he'd say, seven people wounded in fighting in Benghazi, two new panda cubs born at the zoo. And you at home, you're sitting there and you're saying, is this a scary, terrible story? <laughs> or is this a funny, feel-good story? <laughs> or is it the same story? Are pandas now fighting in Benghazi? <laughs> and you know, the really sick thing is, watching Jim Vance is like watching Jeopardy. Sometimes you don't know the answers. <laughs> but you know, I sit there and I knock Jim Vance. The guy is an icon, you know? And they've got this other guy who does do inflections. Pat. <laughs> Dramatic pauses. <laughs> Collins. <laughs> and I used to think, these guys are beating the shit out of us every night? What's going on here? But then I realized, if you put those two guys, these icons, on a major story, and you put all that together, it's not a newscast. It's poetry. I'm telling you, it's poetry. <laughs> it's magic. And I'll give you an example. Big story just a few months ago. Uh, you may have heard about it. There's this uh, politician, his name's Jack Johnson. He fell into trouble with the law, and I don't know, the FBI was kind of, they were tapping his phones and stuff, and well, right before Jim Vance is going to go on the air with a big story, the FBI shows up to arrest his wife, Jack Johnson's wife. And we know what happened at this point in time because, you know, as I said, they were, they were taping their phone calls. So the call went something like this. Oh, my God, Jack, the FBI is going to arrest me any moment. What do I do? And he said, sugar cake, <laughs> pumpkin, don't you worry about a thing. Uh, I'm Jack Johnson. I need you to go upstairs. There's a $100,000 check. I need you to eat it. Now you can put ketchup on it if you want. That'll make it go down a little easier. And then you need to put $80,000 in your underwear. And then she said, oh, Jack, you think of everything. At this time, the newscast is beginning. Jim Vance prepared to go on the air. Dun, 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 dun. And I recognize that's not his music, but it's mine, and I like it. Dun, 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 Jim Vance. The wife of Jack Johnson is being arrested right now. It's a big story. You'd think there'd be an inflection, but I don't do inflection, so screw you. <laughs> Here's Pat Collins. He does. And Pat Collins is out in the field, and he goes, Jim! <sighs> <laughs> and I'm not quite sure why that's exhausting, but it is. <laughs> and then he looks at his notepad, and I wonder to myself, why can't he just memorize one word? Why can't he go, Jim, da, or Jim, ah, uh, and then look? Because with his pauses, no one would know the difference. Well, that's neither here nor there, because at that point in time, Leslie Johnson is coming out of the house. Let me put this over here, because I need to reenact this moment for you, because it's very important that I do this correctly. Leslie comes out of the house like this. Pat Collins is there live. The brilliant reporter that he is, he doesn't need information. He's watching this. And he says, Jim. Uh. Dramatic pause. It appears to this veteran reporter 
that Jack Johnson's wife has junk in the trunk. <laughs> now, ladies, be honest. Your husband says to you, look, I, I need you to eat this check, <laughs> and I need you to shove $80,000 into your bra and your panties. Two things are going to go through your head. One, maybe, just perhaps, there's a slight chance he got this money illegally. <laughs> the second thing that's going to go through your mind is, that bastard's going to strip clubs again. <laughs> but can you be mad at him? He's going to strip clubs, and he's going there as a man of letters doing research. Research on your behalf. So, you know, I'm a filmmaker now, so I'm thinking, why not do a film about Jack Johnson? This beleaguered, misunderstood, public servant, man of letters, researcher. And so my film would start with a sweeping tracking shot, and it would come in. And as it comes into the strip club, it would pan over this way, and you'd see Tiger Woods. And you'd know that Tiger Woods is there for a date. Then it would push by, by Tiger Woods, and it'd come to Charlie Sheen. And you know that Charlie Sheen's there looking for a roommate. <laughs> and that quality daycare that his children have come to know and expect. <laughs> and then it moves on to Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson is sitting there with manuals, just going through all this research. In fact, he's looking at Volume 7, Lady Bits, by Brooke Hatfield. <laughs> And he is mesmerized by that, okay? And then the title comes up, and it's Jack Johnson, Secret Strip Club Research Man. And then the music comes on. My apologies to John Kelly, who's really good at this sort of thing. The song comes on. He's Jack Johnson, Strip Club Research Man. You think he's a perv but he's just doing all the research he can. The stripper's name may be Bambi or Trixie. She may even have a tan. Don't ask Jack, he's oblivious. He's doing research, man. And then it fades to black, and then it comes out on a two-shot. And here's Tiger, and here's Charlie. And they've got testosterone coming out of their head and out of their nostrils, out of their ears. They're like caged animals. They're going crazy, and they're going crazy for a good reason. The stripper hasn't come out yet. But Jack's looking at, well, he's looking at a new manual. It's all about elasticity in G-strings and how it applies to cotton bras and panties. Because he's just doing research. So the stripper comes out. She comes out and she starts doing, she's doing sexy eyes, okay? She's doing this. I'm telling you, Charlie Sheen, Tiger, they're going crazy, okay? We know these guys don't have any class, but they do have cash. And they're just reaching in and they're throwing money like crazy. It's just going everywhere. And then Charlie goes really nuts and starts shoving it in Tiger's boxers. It's just incredible. Now, Jack Johnson hasn't seen any of this because he's doing research. And then suddenly he mutters to himself, it is true. $80,000 will fit in panties and a bra. It's time for my wife to get a girdle. And then the music comes back on. Jack Johnson, super secret strip club research man. He'll never have another legal hurdle because now he's getting his wife a big, fat girdle. Thank you. Our next guest is going last before our headliner is Lizzie O'Leary. Lizzie gave me the sweetest note. Oh, wait, Lizzie doesn't want me to read. That's the note to me. Here's the, wait, hold on. Wait, she gave this to me before the whole thing started, and, I mean, you've got so got nothing to worry about because, like I said, the other women, I mean, your doors stay next to... Um, Lizzie O'Leary's father is here. So, Dad, put your earmuffs on. 
Lizzie O'Leary, everybody. Thank you so much. Daddy. It's more dick jokes than you've heard since Catholic school. <laughs> no, seriously, earmuffs. Good, thank you so much. Um, I, I did actually want to thank everyone for going first and saying all the dirty words that I was going to say that were really embarrassing because I have editors here. And now I feel in incredibly liberated and that I can do that and that's totally fine. I would also like to thank Christina who had the sense, and it says so in the program, to ask me to do this at about 1.30 in the morning on New Year's Eve. And I was like, yeah, totally, that sounds awesome. <laughs> I would totally do stand-up. Next, it'll be reporters, reporters Without Borders or Pants. Like, I don't care. I have no idea what else I agreed to. <laughs> Could happen very easily. But this is Washington, where if we make a mistake, we cling to it. You embrace it. You don't back down from that shit. Do I do something stupid? Yes. Do I think it's a fantastic idea? Yes, I do. Will I stand behind it? Four months. That worked out very well, didn't it, Senator McCain? But sometimes I get behind a microphone. I am on television. I do that sometimes. I did it yesterday. I moderated this panel with Kathleen Sebelius, and it was called The Iron Triangle of Healthcare. <laughs> and I might get fired for this, but that is the stupidest name I have ever heard for a panel in my entire life. Do you want to sit next to a middle-aged woman and have this big sign behind you that says Iron Triangle? That sounds like the world's most terrifying vagina. <laughs> so if you were to put, you know, Woody Allen subtitles next to us, Kathleen Sebelius's would be like, cost, effectiveness, I'm behind the healthcare law. And I'm sitting over here like, vagina, 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 don't say vagina out loud. That would be incredibly embarrassing. You would get fired. You're on television. Don't say vagina. So we do the panel and we do the thing and I get up and it's been like half an hour and the audience is clapping and everything's fine. My fly has been down the entire time. <laughs> I have iron triangled like 250 people. <laughs> it's on the internet, you can look it up, it's really great. But she is only one of, you know, some really prominent women here in Washington, and we're really proud of them. Hillary Clinton is the Secretary of State. That's fantastic. We have come a long way. We're fantastic. Libya has been, you know, you follow the storyline. I've written about it. My colleagues have written about it. It's the women's war. She stood behind it. Yeah, because, you know, it's like maternal instincts. We're going to protect those defenseless civilians and shit. And this is what she was talking about three years ago. Now, little girls, you too can grow up and take the blame for recklessly engaging in a war with no exit strategy or timeline. <laughs> you know she's sitting over there like, fuck, they told me I could let Bill name the war after a stripper and it got this ridiculous name and now I'm sitting here and I have to roll with whatever Barack does. Odyssey Dawn is kind of cool. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, Crystal would be better. But, you know. So I'm from here. I grew up here. I defend Washington in a way that a lot of people don't. I feel very strongly about my hometown. I think it's fantastic. But last week, we kind of sunk to a new low. And I'm, I'm willing to guess that you guys you know, being a media crowd. Some of you subscribe to the New York Times. <laughs> and there was this story about bloggers. Boy, boy bloggers. And they all, like, they write about stuff, and they talk about it on the internet, and sometimes they go on MSNBC, and then they talk about it more. It's really great. 
And they get the name the boy band. And I just feel like that is really inappropriate. A boy band can sing, they can dance, they bleach their hair, they stay in the closet longer than a Biden pool reporter. They have some serious accomplishments. I would like to see you do that, Ezra Klein. Actually, I, I wouldn't. I don't really ever want to hear Ezra sing. No, I feel like boy band is a really, you know, it's not a, it's not a good enough name. It's a bunch of white dudes who circle jerk on the internet and then feel good about themselves and their burgeoning internet power, and we should call them Politico editors. <laughs> or White House senior staff. Either one works fine. Okay, so... I actually, I feel like those guys are, are moving ahead in the world, and one of them's here. Hi, Dave. I don't know where you went. But I, I have a lesson for you in terms of your future career and where you're going to go and your branding. Branding is very important because news organizations are dying, so you want to embrace your own brand. This is game change. Some of you may or may not have read it. We're going to start with page eight. And the important thing in the new media world is you have a message and you stick to it because you want the world to understand. They're not that smart. Page eight. And they all left in radically different places. Obama, confident to the point of cockiness. Clinton, desperate but determined to save herself. Edwards, doomed but playing the angles. Looking back on it, they all agreed Iowa had been a game changer. <laughs> Page 61. I don't think money is our problem, Daly said. Judging by his performance the past two years, Obama was a money manager and one who might be able to change the game <laughs> by tapping into small donors to an unprecedented degree. Page 138. Trippy thought John was high in his own vapors and considering himself equal to Clinton and Obama. And, but he also believed that if Edwards could beat them both in Iowa, it might be enough of a... There you go, to propel him to the nomination. Seriously? Really? I want my own HBO special because this is bullshit. <laughs> and that is your lesson for the evening. You guys have been very patient. Mark Halpern, call me. I will buy you a thesaurus. It is really not that expensive. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Wow. Lizzie O'Leary and her iron triangle. Very well done. Mr. O'Leary, you must be very proud. <laughs> Nothing like Catholic school, right? <clears throat> okay, before I bring on our headliner, what was the word of the night, beginning of the evening? Say it. Galifianakis. Let me tell you a little something about that. Let me tell you a little something about that. I met, uh, when I first got syndicated, I uh, went to a syndication party and met George Will. You all know Mr. Will, or at least of, I still call him Mr. Will, uh, or, or you know him personally, you know, and I introduced myself. Hi, Mr. Will. I'm Nick Galifianakis. And he went, what's that? I said, Galifianakis. Hmm. He was being polite with his tweed and glasses and his straight hair. And, <clears throat> you know, he was trying to be nice. And, but he could tell still there was like fl that flavor of like I had a little National Geographic quality to me. <clears throat> we got along famous. I just brought up baseball and it was all good. 
I became aware of the differentness of my last name when I was a small child. Some of you might know my uncle, Nick Galifianakis, was a congressman in North Carolina. And he ran for the Senate against Jesse Helms. And actually, even though Helms outspent him by, you know, Helms's pattern of outspending everybody, it was still sort of neck and neck. And then Nixon did a southern swing, very famous southern swing, and he came up. And they started putting these billboards up all over the place that said, vote for Jesse. He's one of us. Your last name is Galifianakis in North Carolina. You ain't one of us. <laughs> and they were explaining it to me. I was a little kid, and I uh, learned another word that day, Greek word as well, xenophobia. <laughs> My Uncle Nick went on to a, a storied uh, law career, and I eventually uh, grew up, well, I got older, and uh, <laughs> it became syndicated, and so the name Galifianakis got out there a little bit more around the country. And then, as many of you know, my cousin Zaki caught fire, and so now there are people in the Congo who can say Galifianakis. What you think about that, Jesse? Actually, sorry. What you think about that, Jesse? Okay. Our headliner this evening, Miles O'Brien, is a 30-year broadcast news veteran who has successfully melded a talent for telling complex stories in accessible terms my father's leaving. Sorry, Miles. <clears throat> With a lifelong passion for aviation, space, science, technology, through his production company, he creates engaging stories for various media outlets, including the PBS NewsHour, Frontline, Discovery Science Channel, National Science Foundation. Well, let me. This is going to take a while, Miles. <clears throat> space flight now. He wrote the Ten Commandments, and he was raised on the third day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miles O'Brien. Hello? Am I supposed to use this one? Hi, I'm Miles. I just flew in from uh, Chernobyl. No shit. I'm a little jet lagged, but I'm otherwise feeling good. I got this hat there. With the hair, <laughs> should grow back. You know, uh, I learned while I was there, Chernobyl in Russian uh, means uh, big fuck up. <laughs> and uh, you know, hey, by the way, I was researching it. Yeah, this will grow back, I hope. Uh, I was researching it. The last words said in that control room before the explosion: "Watch this." <laughs> Some things are universal, I suppose. Um, Chernobyl, I don't know if you heard, they, the Ukrainians, a little bit desperate for money, they want to open up Chernobyl to tourism. For real, like a theme park, meltdown land, you know? You go, you go to Mushroom Cloud Mountain or Hiroshima Land or you know, buy the toys because they, they all glow in the dark. Um, <laughs> why not, I guess? Uh, it's interesting, you know, maybe, maybe they should think about this in, in Japan. The, the Tokyo Disneyland had to shut down. Fukushima, potential Fukushima land, and um, why not do it sooner rather than later? That's true adventure tourism, right? Um, one thing about going to uh, Meltdown Land, uh, they have a problem with litter there because the nuclear industry is not very good about disposing of, it, of its waste. So you got to be careful there. Um, you know, we are pretty morbid people when you think about it, when you want to go to Chernobyl or Meltdown Land. Why the hell else would 68 million people watch that Friday, Friday shit, you know? Um, it's interesting that, you know, the PBS NewsHour sent me over there, and they said, you know, go cover the nuclear accident. I said, I'm not going to cover the nuclear accident. It's actually going on. That could be dangerous. <laughs> so why not do the one that happened 25 years ago? And the... The good, thing, the good thing about the PBS NewsHour is they kind of like their news to settle a little bit. It gets a little better, better with age. Um, my, my next big piece is going to be a nice takeout on the Michael Dukakis campaign. So, 
too soon for that? <laughs> Truth is, I was going through the library looking at some of their footage from back in April of 1986, and it blew me away. It's the same music, it's the same set, it's the same anchors. It's, uh, this is a show that is afraid to scare its viewers and perhaps cause their sudden death in nursing homes all across the land. We got a code blue, they've changed the graphics. People are dying all across the country. Um, their new funder, they're very proud to announce, is Ambien. This is good news. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, this is no shit. I was, I was watching the, uh, the footage from 1986, and there was an ITN report, and it was a report from Poland. And uh, the reporter, and British guy, says, and Polish authorities are warning people here not to drink milk from cows that graze out of doors. Now think about that for a minute. Where does a cow go to eat indoors? <laughs> McDonald's? That could go badly, right, for a cow? I think that would be uh, a good follow-up piece, you know, the Polish indoor cow grazing industry. Sounds utterly fascinating. Yeah, I know, I had to do one of those. You know, and I, I'm not a scientist, I play one on TV. Um, and anybody who tells you these days that they're a TV science journalist is really jobless and probably close to being homeless, which is me. Uh, I was fired a couple of years ago along with the eight producers who propped my sorry ass up at CNN. And, uh, you know, I understand it now. I have some perspective on it. What the fuck did we know about Charlie Sheen, you know? <laughs> so now, so now we have weather people doing science on CNN. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, I've caught a few things, and I do get a little secret pleasure out of watching some of it, frankly. Uh, they talk about, they compare the nuclear meltdown to turning on your self-cleaning oven and leaving it on, uh, running your car dry, the radiator dry in your car. Uh, there was um, this whole thing about the radiation cloud that was supposedly coming over, and one of the correspondents was saying, it's just a teensy weensy bit of radiation. No, it's like for kindergartners or something. One of them said it'll be less radiational when it gets here. <laughs> no shit. Another one said if, if the containment vessel breaks over there at Fukushima, it'll be like putting the popcorn in the microwave for too long. It's the Jiffy Pop syndrome. I don't know. You know, that magic wall apparently can't make them very smart, can it? So uh, it's magic, but not that magic. Uh, you know, it's interesting, though, in, in the newsroom, there is this sense that science is painful. After all, people in newsrooms usually ran from science. That's why they're in the news business. And, um, you know, let's screw the science. It, it's hard. It's complicated. It costs some money. Let's book the Friday, Friday girl. Screw it, right? But I do have to give you a true confession. I'm a history major who covers science. But I'm really good at building IKEA shit which I've been doing a lot of lately. I mean, where else can you go? You go to Ikea. Has everybody been to Ikea? Clap if you've been to Ikea, you know. <laughs> right, you go through, and it's like this show house, and it's all this beautiful fake shit with the fake stuff on the computer and the TV and the flowers, and you go, God, that's a great-looking king-size bedroom set, and look at the whole thing is 500 bucks. And you get down to the warehouse, and this whole room full of furniture is in a box the size of a briefcase. And you open it up, you open it up, and you have to assemble the screws. I mean, <laughs> when have you had to do that? I mean, what's next? You open it up, and there's a, a sapling of a pine tree in a chemistry set, you know? <laughs> Plant it, a little bit of water, a little iron ore, a little coke. You're going to have yourself furniture someday. You know, I think the media really should apologize like the Japanese do. The Japanese are really good at apologizing. Man, they bow like crazy. They apologize. They apologize for their apologies. You know, they can't sleep. They, you know, they're telling the prime minister to get her some rest. I'm, I'm sure, you know, some Harry Carey is coming anytime soon. And what do we get? We get Bernie Madoff and Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job, you know? Which reminds me, I was, I was in Texas uh, about three days after the earthquake hit. You know, Japan is in rolling blackouts. You got the nuclear crisis. And I'm in the shuttle van to go to the airport. This true story, family gets in behind me. I start making small talk with them. 
hey, where are you headed? We're going to Japan. I said, I said, you're kidding, right? No, we're going to Japan. And I said, have you read the papers? Does anybody read the papers anymore here in Texas? I don't know. There's been a little problem in, in Japan, and you may not want to go to Japan. Oh, no, we planned it a year ago, and we called the tour group, and they said it'd be just fine over there. And so I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is a stubborn decision, not well thought out, no good exit strategy, an international adv adventure that really wasn't well thought out. No wonder they like George W. Bush there, right? Oh, we got Bush fans here? <laughs> a lot of, a lot of you uh, people might know that I was going to fly on the space shuttle to the International Sp uh, Space Station. That's a true story. But that went by the boards when we lost uh, Columbia, unfortunately. Sad note there. But um, in the midst of doing that, trying to get that all, that deal put together, I spent a lot of time negotiating with the Russians because I figured that would scare the NASA into putting me on the shuttle. <laughs> and so in the midst of all of this, uh, I uh, was talking to one of these bushy hair, bushy eyebrowed uh, commissar types. And uh, we were talking about what it would take for me to fly on a Soyuz rocket to the space station. I really wanted to go, obviously. So he, um, he said, well, you, of course, you would have to have the physical. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. The physical is no problem. He said, it is a two-week physical. Not doing a very good Russian there, but two-week physical. I said, how, is it, how, how much coughing and rubber glove treatment can a man take in a, <laughs> in a lifetime, in two weeks? I mean, if only they had spent that much time and focus on their nuclear power plants. We wouldn't have had... The problem, you know, so really what's happening now, of course, is this tourist industry is developing in space, $250,000 for about five minutes or so of free flying on the Virgin Galactic spaceship that uh, Richard Branson is working on. Five minutes, $250,000 to be weightless. What will people do to lose weight? I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, that is something. Uh, of course, I, I know the real reason that people are going, Going to space, you okay out there? <laughs> and I, I know this by the way people ask questions of me. First of all, little kids always ask, how do you go to the bathroom in space? To which I answer, it sucks. Literally. <laughs> Think about it. The, but the real reason, and then of course adults always ask, well come on, who's, you know, somebody, somebody's been in the 250 mile high club. Who has hit this? Who has hit the zero G spot? <laughs> and um, I, I've done a fair amount of research on this, in my spare time. You know, it's all for the sake of reporting. And there is, I know this is hard to believe, but there is, uh, there are some inaccuracies on the internet on this issue. Hard to imagine. But supposedly, uh, in the mid 80s on a flight, STS-75, space shuttle mission, uh, they, they tried uh, several sessions involving elastics, seat belts, and an inflatable tunnel to ensure that all this would kind of work. So I, I looked up that mission, and it's, it's an all-guy mission. <laughs> NASA, nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that, but I don't think that necessarily happened. Having said that, I do think it will happen eventually. It probably will involve some duct tape, some Velcro, and some WD-40. But the uh, <laughs> truth is, I think the Russians probably already did it. Uh, I, was, I was talking with Hugh Gibson, who is a shuttle commander who flew one of the uh, early missions to the space station Mir. And after we had finished the interview and the cameras had stopped rolling, he, um, he said, you know, hey, I got, I got something I got to tell you. He said, I think they're smoking up there. I said, really? How do they do that? He said, no, they sit by the airlock and they smoke and they send it out the airlock while they're drinking vodka. And I thought, that's great. Krusty the Clown is a cosmonaut. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Truth is, I, I'm not going to go to space. That's probably not going to happen. So I have a little airplane that I fly, which is great because I can keep my shoes on whenever I want, take them off when I want. I can fly with a cigar lighter, nail clippers, even a big vat of shampoo if I want. It's dicey stuff, people, dicey stuff. And, of course, you can become a double platinum member in the Mile High Club. Now, you may say, well, is that safe to be flying and doing something like that. Well, it keeps you awake, which is more than we can say for the air traffic controllers. <laughs> we should get some fluffers for air traffic control. Maybe that would keep them going, right? 
Actually, what I do a lot of times uh, is um, while I'm flying along and it's kind of late at night, just for fun with the air traffic controllers, I'll key the microphone and I'll say, we have airplanes, Allah Akbar. And boy, that wakes them up, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm Miles O'Brien, thank you very much. Well done. We're going to bring our judges up here. And they and you are going to pick a winner or a winner for tonight. They're all winners. Let's give a hand for all the contestants tonight. Rapidly thinning crowd. I think it's only the contestants are still here. All right, well, the good news is uh, I think we all can agree the winner is obvious. Um, all right, maybe not so much. All right, this is... Um, Hello. You know, when, I, when, I, when I agreed to judge this thing, I thought, well, this will be, this will be pretty, mm -hmm. e pretty easy gig. I just come here, have a few drinks, pick out who's funniest, and I had no idea that everybody was going to be so funny. Um, I had no idea. It, apparently, it rained in the fifth inning. Uh, the crowd was a little, a little more fleshed out earlier. Oh man! <laughs> all right, let's get everybody up on stage here. How are we going to do this? How? how what are we're we... going to do is we're going to we're going to bring all the uh, contestants up on stage. Really? And uh, it, that's crazy. And uh, that's completely nuts. That's crazy. And then and then we'll narrow it down, and uh, and unlike last year, they'll actually you know decide. Oh man, I gotta tell you. Not a rating show. You know, it's like you know at the Academy Awards they always say you know it's just an honor just to be nominated. I'm just glad to be here. Uh, I gotta tell you the uh, it's it's I, whoever wins this thing tonight. I'm gonna tell you right now it's a random event Sorry. because it's just a, it's a it's a you know just figure out right now that whoever actually is named the winner it's just a random event because. Uh, there are at least uh, 12 people tied for first place at this point, in my opinion. And I say that because I'm a judge, so I know. <laughs> Nevertheless, we're going to go through the charade, much like the 2004, uh, uh, which election was that? 2000? 2000. 2000 you know, we'll even. just pick a winner and, you know, we'll have some hanging chads and they can all litigate it later and the Supreme Court can pick the wrong person. Uh, you know, for political reasons. That's how this is all going to end up. I guarantee it. But instead of the White House, you get uh, a tiara. Okay, so how do we do that? How, uh, Rich, uh, how are you going to do this? What, all right. What do you, what's your plan? Well, the plan is, uh, I, well, Jamie, you're taller, so you're no, going to, no, 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 no you have to go back there, and you have to put your hand above everyone's head, and then <laughs> you, everyone applauds if you think that that's your favorite oh. comedian or oh, act. Man. Oh, man. Yeah. And How this, embarrassing. This sucks. This piss, it sucks. Well, this, Christina made this up. Christina, right. do you want to... Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go with the, you know... Christina's idea, as, we'll as, call it. Uh, as Donald Rumsfeld would no, say, you, you go to war with the, with the just, system you have, not the one you hope everyone? to have in the future. Okay. All right. All right. So um, we're going to start okay. in order. We're yeah, going to do ready? this. All right. One, two, three, go. I should well, probably do yeah, names I'm gonna read here. Their, but I'm, well, no, I'm going to read their names out so we don't just yeah, go by yeah, face. I know. Okay. I know it's, I forget, I'm, I'm all over the place here. No, that was it's Tim Young, by the Tim, way. Tim, Tim, Tim Young. Let's go. Let's start with Tim. Tim. Rich. I got the order. You got the order? Yeah. Okay. And now, now we're at uh, Nadia. Is it Nadia? Nadia Bilbasi. Nadia? <laughs> Meredith Shiner. Scott Lanham. Mike Walter. Yeah, that's good, right? Mike, Mike Walter has a very big family, I see. Okay. Mike Kelly. John Kelly. John Kelly. Sean Waterman. Yeah. 
I want all the men to scream for this one. Brooke Hatfield. I want all the potential employers to scream for this one. Jamila Bay. And Mr. O'Leary's daughter. We are so screwed. We're so screwed. We need a subcategory for like best boots, best comedian with, with, a, with an English accent. We need Sean some subcategories. The, Sean, the swimsuit competition? Um, oh, so, so. Okay. So I just have to confer over here for yeah. a second. <laughs> should we, should we, all right, mics are off, guys. All right, here we go. For those of you that didn't think the Three Stooges was funny, it's like, <laughs> we're reminding you. Okay, so which one do you think is hottest? Uh, uh, Sean. Sean is there, no? Yeah. No, they're all Who right. would look best in the hat? This is a, okay. I, I, um, I, say, we, I say we vote again. I, I say we vote again. All right, you, you conducted. No, we'll be tweet. Come forward, Mr. Kelly. Come forward. No, no, I'm sorry, Walter. Walter. You're all Irish. It's like everybody's Irish, and there's a black person in a Greek. I don't know. I'm not a Jew in the stage. It's a all right, we're we're gonna here. we're going with. I'm uh, All right, so uh, have we decided we're having a did clap off? Is did, that it? Yeah. Did, did you say by did you say by rejection you're Jewish? Okay, Brooke. Brooke. All right. All right. Mike. Okay. Is there, right. Are we having anybody else? Time. That's it. We're just going with these two. We're gonna do. We're gonna vote again. Wait. Wait. Okay. Okay. Oh, you've got that. God, right. I'm glad that you're deciding this and not me. Judges shouldn't have right. to judge. For Mike, this is your last chance. So this is it. For Mike. Walter, former. All right, if that's the best you can do. We just have to go with that. Okay, for for Brooke. Brooke. They are not making this easy. Nick, do you, do you have a you have a verdict on that? Do you uh, you don't? They are not making this easy. Yeah. You know, Rich and I did say before this started that since we got stuck, you know, with a tie last year. See, we, look, the crowd didn't want that last year, did they? We we thought, you know, that, and you know, that it ties like kissing your sister. Yeah. Which I actually think is kind of hot. I'm actually, an only child. I didn't have a sister either. Yeah. So. What do you I don't do? Know. I don't, I what don't do you do when you talk? I'm giving this to you. I'm, no. I'm giving it up to you. No. Christina. All right. <laughs> I, don't, I you know, don't. You chose us to judge, so clearly you're going to have to make the decision. We have to pick someone? All right. Oh. Mike. Mike's face just broke okay. just hearing that news. Oh, Ladies God. and gentlemen. This is awful. We will now announce which contestant is safe for another week. <laughs> could it be Mike Walter? Or could it be Brooke? And in, an, in a complete arbitrary and capricious decision, I will present the crown to... Brooke. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's the best I could do. There she is, Miss Comedia. There she is, our cup of tea. Can I tell y'all a joke that I forgot to put in my act and I feel totally like an asshole about it? Um, 
Hey, okay, well, number one, A, I'm a design director. I'm not even a journalist, so joke's on y'all. Number two, number two, here's a joke I forgot to put in my act or whatever. So once I was at a Mexican restaurant with some friends of mine at this really rural paper in Northeast Georgia where I first started, and there were two different types of guacamole on the menu. One was regular guacamole, one was Texas guacamole. And they asked me, what do you think the difference is? And I was like, well, clearly the Texas guacamole executes retarded people. <laughs> Done. Drop the microphone. That's all I got. I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't offend anyone. He looks very good in a tiara, you have to admit. Everyone, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Please come back next year. And if any journalists in the audience feel like they can do this, come talk to me before you leave. Oh, and we're going to Old Ebbets afterwards. Everyone's invited. Come on. Good night. <laughs>